Hello, I'm Lisa Wedeen, and it's a pleasure to introduce my colleague, friend, and comrade, Hassan Haj. It's an almost indescribable moment after two years of this pandemic to welcome a scholar whose academic home is in Australia back to the United States to the University of Chicago. Thank you for making the trip, Hassan, and thank you to 3CT Associate Director Anna Searle Jones for all of her help in making this event a reality. Thanks are also owed to our co-sponsors, the Posen Family Center for Human Rights, the Department of Anthropology, and the Faculty Working Group Committee on Environment, Geography, and Urbanization, SIGU. Last but not least, thank you to 3CT's fabulous student assistants, Skyann and Jenny Paul, and to Hadil Bardani, who will field the Zoom Q&A, and the IT team, Joe Bonnie and his staff, that work so hard to make hybrid events possible. For many here, Professor Haj needs no introduction. His works on the comparative anthropology of racism, nationalism, and multiculturalism, particularly in Australia and the Middle East, have been critically acclaimed. He has written and conducted fieldwork on the Lebanese transnational diaspora in Australia, the United States, Europe, Canada, and Venezuela. He has been a high profile contributor to debates on multiculturalism in Australia and has published prolifically on the topic. Among his numerous books and articles is his exceptionally influential White Nation, which draws on Jacques Lacan, Pierre Bourdieu, and whiteness studies to critically interpret ethnographic work conducted in Australia. Widely debated in Australia, with many of its themes picked up by anti-racism activists in other countries, that book led to a learned and passionate follow-up against paranoid nationalism. He has also written on the political dimensions of critical anthropology, essays compiled in a volume entitled Altered Politics, Critical Thought and the Radical Imagination, that's Melbourne University Press 2015. One of his most recent writings is Racism and Environmental Threat 2017. That's a salutary intertwining of analyses of racism and ecological crisis. And of course, there's his last book published by the University of Chicago Press in 2021 entitled The Diaspora Condition, Ethnographic Explorations of the Lebanese in the World, a book that presages, I, I'm guessing, some of the issues he's going to discuss today in his lecture, Lenticular Ontologies. As is evident from these titles, Haj has his finger on the pulse of contemporary politics and brings to bear on these matters an uncommon theoretical acuity. Like the title of this series, Theorizing the Present, Haj manages to theoretically grapple with the present without being presentist. His combination of political engagement, creative estrangement, and critical theory attunement make him one of the most engaging, enlivening, and important social theorists of our time. His experiences of exile, his refusal to fetishize nationalism, his insistence on political solidarities that transcend nation state boundaries, and his understanding that people can dwell in multiple places simultaneously offer us a window into a world of alternative political imaginaries. One's not tethered to our conventional understandings of people, place, space, or time. I personally have learned a tremendous amount from him. So thank you, Hassan. And now without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Hassan Hajj to 3CT. Thank you very much, Lisa. And thank you, Anna, for organizing all this. Uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be able to discuss with you a little bit of aspects of sort of like a condition uh, is an element of, or well, the central element probably of, of the book. But also I will sort of like try and uh, give you a sense of uh, what I want to do with it uh, in not just in this particular empirical, uh, empirical situation. 
uh, I also have to say that uh, I am a little bit nostalgic and sad uh, to be here. And I have to say this uh, because uh, last time I was invited to give uh, a paper for 3 CT. It was uh, uh, Laurent Belland who invited me. And so uh, I, I'm thinking of her all the time now. So. Uh, so let me, so what I will do is I try to divide up my time a bit like a third of the time framing how I came to the lenticular condition in this ethnographic work, a third of the time talking about the lenticular condition and uh, lenticular ontology and uh, what it means uh, in particular. But, and uh, the last uh, uh, sort of like shooting off a bit with you about uh, possible applications uh, of it. Uh, but I want to frame uh, a bit the book, I frame the book and I frame certain, a certain phase, if you like, in, uh, in my work, uh, which has to do with trying to uh, define the political uh, intellectual and about the relationship between the political and uh, the intellectual. Uh, I'm sure what I'm going to say is not uh, something everybody <laughs> will kind of agree with. But I've gone through various stages in my academic career of being political in various ways. And I've been uh, yeah, a totally political animal, if you like, if you read my. But at the same time, I, I sort of like felt, uh, and I'm feeling increasingly, that uh, is there is a certain space that needs to be defined where intellectual life, academic life, defines its politics autonomously from the political. Uh, and what I mean by this is that there are certain urgencies of the political field, of political life, that are different from the urgencies of academic life. And uh, that sometimes I feel uh, increasingly so. By living, I don't know if I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the same everywhere, but I feel there is a uh, non going delegitimization of academia as a profession, uh, as a profession. Uh, as uh, a pursuit, uh, devalorization of it. And I'm starting to fear that the reaction to this devalorization is an attempt to valorize it by overvalorizing the political. So the political becomes the means of saying why what we do is so important, uh, etc. And so I want to try and recover something about why pursuing something academic is important. And so, uh, you know, something very banal like the importance of thinking hard. Uh, you know, I like to celebrate uh, the conditions which allow us to think hard and defend them. And what I would like to think is that it's not a withdrawal from the political, what I'm doing, but rather it is really asking the question, well, what is it that I, as an academic, what is it that I have to inject in the political that is original and that is academic? Am I supposed to simply accept how the political world defines its imperatives and then philosophize that, give ammunition to this side or that side 
uh, accept the science of politics? Uh, am I simply supposed to provide yeah, the intellectual work for people engaged in politics? Or am I supposed to inject something in the political that might be totally outside of politics and therefore which legitimizes in a way why I am doing what I'm doing. So, so this is partly to explain that I uh, kind of like start the book with an almost, I, I think attack would be a bit too much to say that, it's not an attack, but a kind of distancing from uh, uh, what I've called a kind of like forensic, forensic mode of thinking diaspora, which is always about uh, a political problem. Uh, where uh, we academics uh, approach migration diaspora as a problem. Uh, is it possible to approach it without thinking it as a social problem? And I, what I mean by a social problem, it can be a social problem uh, for the sending uh, nation, brain drain, etc. So I do the work uh, for brain, say, is it, is it causing the brain, brain drain, etc. Uh, it, it's, is it a problem for the receiving nation? My, my, my sort of like, uh, are people uh, integrating? What is the economic cost? Uh, what are the political repercussions, et cetera, et cetera. But notice it's not just that migrants can be a problem for the nation that is sending them, or uh, there's also a long tradition which I participated in wholeheartedly, which is saying that uh, the nations themselves are a problem for the immigrants. Uh, that if the immigrant comes and the nation itself is a problem. Uh, but, and I'm including that, uh, that's also part of thinking social problems, I'm gonna help with racism or, you know, but uh, there is a lefty tradition where somehow it's bad if you help the government govern. And it's good if you help those who oppose government sort of like to work with them. And so if you are doing footwork for anti-racists, that's really good. But if you're doing work for the government, etc., that's not so good. But the principle really is still the same in what I'm approaching here in the sense that you're doing the work and so that's what I call it. I I call it. It's a bit. It's a bit like detective stories. Who who did the bad thing to the immigrants? Who did the bad thing to the diaspora? It's a long story. Who did the bad thing to the women? Who did the bad thing to the blacks? Who did? Who killed? Who killed? And as I say in the book, it's not even an Inspector Clouseau thing, whereby it's a kind of uh, who done it. Because we already know who did everything. <laughs> we already know that capitalism did it, sexism did it, patriarchy did it, uh, racism did it. We already know all this sort of like, it's not kind of like nobody's going to say, do a study from, oh my God, patriarchy. <laughs> uh, uh, sort of like, no, you know, we know all these things. So it's, uh, it's, it reminded me a bit more of, uh, I don't know, if this American uh, detective uh, television series, which I used to see in my in my early days, all of you seem young here, so I don't know if they still run Detective Columbo, uh, and Detective Columbo was quite unique compared to because in the stories of Detective Columbo, you begin by saying he knows who did it. And the whole thing is about him telling you, I'm right. I've shown you that my intuition was right. This person did it, etc. So we always, always proceed like this uh, intellectually. It's sort of like, you know, it's not a discovery. It's kind of like, I'll show you. I know we did it. I'm going to show you, etc. So, 
you know, as I said, I'm not trying to be superior to people who do this because I've done it all my life and I still do it. So it's not a kind of like, uh, don't do it or anything of the sort. I just feel like I also want to do, I also, and with an importance on also, want to do something different. Uh, and yeah. And so this, this, this book is a bit like this in the sense of like, instead of starting with problems, it's saying, well, how do people live? Uh, it was, it's very interesting also, and I'll go quickly through that, because it's very interesting, you see, for someone who has written so much on racism, uh, like me, uh, to start working on this. And when I started presenting in Australia, but also in Europe, I haven't, uh, presented on this uh, in US. Actually, I did in LA. But anyway, but but uh, sort of like when I present, there would be a lot of uh, people uh, racialized. And they say, why why aren't you doing any more uh, this kind of work? Sort of like sort of like fighting racism, etc which was not true actually i was writing at the time even though i was thinking this i was writing this racism and environmental threat thinking about it the two but but the more interesting thing in australia is that you, there would be some uh white people who would come and say to me hey you've just given a whole talk about migrants and you didn't mention any of us <laughs> and <laughs> And sort of like, you know, we used to come into your papers and you would bash us, white people. I, I like it more when you bash us rather than when you don't mention us at all. <laughs> this is how sort of like people would think, sort of like this. So the idea is that, and so it, there was something political despite myself in a sense in this book where I found kind of like, uh, sort of like it's, it's a kind of phenomenon sort of like narcissism, whereby as <laughs> say, it was kind of like a message to white people whereby, you know, we don't think about you all the bloody time. <laughs> sort of like sometimes we don't think of you at all for months and months, sort of like, I know racism is a structure, and etc. but it happens, life happens like this. And so, yeah, so there is very little about racist white people. It's about people, living conditions, uh, how as I struggle for a uh, you know, concept that is increasingly important for me. I'm giving more talks about this in Colombia, which is uh, what I call viability, how people struggle for their viability and the struggle for viability, the anthropology of viability, what it means to center yourself on how people pursue uh, viability. So, so what do I do in the diaspora condition? First of all, I'm interested in the diaspora condition as both a condition of being, what it means to be diasporic, but also as a condition of the social. What is a social world that is, what is a life world that is diasporic? And even though there's a the here, uh, it's a bit of a cheeky though, really, because I'm not trying to define the <laughs> diasporic condition. Uh, I am trying to say that there is a diasporic condition, which is today the diasporic condition, because it's a modern diasporic condition. And so uh, I am trying to add uh, different kind of plurality, a sense of plurality of diasporas and arguing that, you know, all the studies that come from Jewish diaspora, Armenian diaspora, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all of them uh, sort of like have very important things to say. So I'm not trying to set this against other theories of uh, diaspora, but I'm trying to capture a diaspora such as the Lebanese diaspora, 
and arguing that diaspora is actually the culture of Lebanese, of Lebanese modernity. Diaspora is the culture of Lebanese modernity. So this is sort of like a claim which kind of like immediately has interesting repercussions because usually the association, the first association you do when you talk about diaspora is migration. And when you say diaspora is the culture of Lebanese modernity, I'm actually saying is that migration is not the condition of the formation of diasporic culture, but is a component of the formation of diasporic culture. So, so I'm interested in how Lebanon, and so, and I'm putting it schematically and quickly, you know, uh, European modernity involved migration, but migration of peasants to cities, mainly. And it involved a certain sense of uh, peasants becoming more aware of their national space. Um, then you have uh, colonial diasporas. So Algeria was colonized by the French. It triggered a diasporic or migratory movement from Algeria to France. Now the Lebanese, it's a very different beast. And that's what interests me, you see, because Lebanon was also colonized uh, by, by France. But the migration that result and France sort of brought capitalism into Lebanon through the silk industry, etc., and creating wage labor, creating conditions. But it did not result in the Lebanese going to France. What it resulted is, and that's the first thing that fascinates me that I examine uh, a lot, is what I call the internationalization of the space of viability is the internationalization of the space of viability. What does it mean? It's an amazing thing when you think about it. It's, I'm interested in this historical moment when a Lebanese villager, and I don't know if you have a sense of Lebanese mountains, but they're pretty rough, tough mountains. Right? These, these villagers are pretty autarkic, sort of like for, for years and years and sort of like, and it's not that the Lebanese didn't have a consciousness of the world. They always had a consciousness of the world through a variety of things. But what interests me is this, it's the moment a peasant gets up, I'm being obviously a bit sort of like performative here, but gets up and says, Okay, I'm gonna go to Scotanovia. I mean, can you think this sort of like, we know that once people migrate, they create chain uh, migration, but I'm still talking about this primary moment where the Lebanese, instead of thinking their modernity by moving from the village to the city only, mm -hmm. think that the whole world is the place where they can make a living. This is what I'm calling the internationalization of the space of viability. And so this is an amazing state of consciousness when you think about it, sort of like move from being in a peasant thing to start thinking, okay. Where am I going to go in the world? I mean, Texas, uh, Queensland, I don't know if you know Australia, but for God's sake, Queensland, <laughs> <laughs> sort of like, yeah, Canada, Brazil, etc., etc. And so, so the phenomena is amazing, uh, you know, because again, I don't know if you know the numbers, but uh, I mean, Lebanon has. A very small country, and what we're talking about at that time was not actually Lebanon, it was a province in Syria, which was Mount Lebanon that interests me here, is sort of like, and that 
the numbers are minuscule, but the numbers of migrants that we end up with is the offshoot is amazing relative to the number of the population. I don't think, in fact, I'm still not 100% sure, but I don't think in relative terms there is any country which has as many migrants outside of it relative to the number of people uh, inside uh, the country. I mean, the problem with numbers is that they are part of Lebanese mythology about migration. So you go somewhere and the Lebanese say, so, so, so how many are you? A billion, sort of like. <laughs> and so you, you can't do research by asking actually people sort of like uh, how many here and how many here. But at the same time, despite that the mythology itself is very telling and it involves a kind of like interesting, interesting uh, dimension. So anyway, there's lots of them <laughs> all over the world, a lot more than so I'm interested in this consciousness, how it emerges as a consciousness of capitalist modernity in Lebanon. And it's a kind of petty entrepreneurial <coughs> migration in its aspiration, even though lots of them work uh, in, as laborers, but in the fantasy of migration, it's uh, always entrepreneurial. <clears throat> so another aspect that I investigate in the book and which takes us a bit more closely <clears throat> to the lenticular -like condition and the corollary of this internationalization is what I call a permanent state of comparative existence. <clears throat> a very funny moment <clears throat> in, uh, in a book. Uh, so I was actually in San Francisco visiting this American Lebanese couple, because I got to know them when I was doing field work in, in the village. And, uh, and the American husband, so we were having lunch, and the American husband started kind of like half jokingly saying, sort of like about his Lebanese wife, that. They went on holiday, they visited the Grand Canyon. She looked at the Grand Canyon, she said, ah, oh, this reminds me of Wadi Adisha. <laughs> and he was going to say, well, can we ever go anywhere that doesn't remind you of Lebanon? <laughs> I mean, Lebanon is just like a tiny piece of land, yet it seems to remind you of every single place in the world, sort of like, uh, what is this? And another couple kept on going in the same same way. And it reminded me of uh, myself, actually, when I left in my 20, I was 20 to, to Australia. And they took me almost like second or third week I arrived in Sydney. They drove me somewhere and they said to me, we're going to take you somewhere. It looks exactly like Our Lady of Lebanon, Harissa, if you look at it, sort of like going up from the mountain and looking, looking at the sea. And my uncle, who was born in Australia <coughs> and uh, so has never been to Lebanon, was driving us. He said to me, every time some Lebanese comes, I drive them to Bulai Pass, which is what's the name. And now, I know so much about Harissa just because I drive the bullet pass. So, so the idea is that you, and this is how I started thinking it, that the diasporic mode of being is always haunted spatially. You cannot look at something and just look at it. I say, ah, but, and I'm not only talking about <clears throat> about uh, looking at landscapes. So you cannot take a job without thinking, uh, should I, you cannot go study at university without thinking, oh, maybe I should go somewhere else. You, 
everything is comparative, transnationally comparative. And this consciousness is part and parcel of uh, the internationalization of the space of viability. Where do I go? Where do I go? Now, when I started investigation this comparison, I came to something uh, like quite dramatic, if you like, <laughs> uh, just by thinking about it uh, over time and sort of like, you know, I mean, like this is 25 years, uh, by the way, of field work. Uh, so, so like I had the time to think and rethink and sort of like rethink and rethink again. And, and one of the things when we were talking about this comparative, I was saying, actually, because when I wrote down comparative mode of existence, I, I remember the passage of Claude Levis Foss, where he actually talks about the role of comparative logic in the formation of modernity. And so I went uh, to it, and sure enough, uh, my memory was good. He does talk about it. And he talks about uh, how, well, you know, very classic Levi Strauss says, is to be modern is to have a vantage point to look at yourself. But he uses the example of teaching Latin and teaching Greek and thinking with with Greek and Latin. And he says, he says that in some way it's like a primary anthropology, what we are taught when we teach ourselves to be comparative. But it made me think that actually the diasporic comparative mode is even more so uh, a primary anthropology because Greek and Latin, etc., they are more historical comparison languages that are not uh, alive. And so, however, uh, for Claude Levi Strauss, the comparison is very scholastic. But if I compare, I compare uh, just so I can understand my culture better uh, or something like this. And that's where I started thinking something quite different and important, which is that when a Lebanese migrant says, it reminds me of, it's not just an innocent comparison, it's an affective comparison. It is also trying to say, kind of like, ah, oh, I've got nice things here. I've got nice things in my country too, you know. And I started thinking about this, I've got nice things in my country too. And why do I need to say, I've got nice things? It was as if there was an implicit exchange that is going on, whereby uh, the Anglo husband, the Anglo American husband said, Look what my country has to offer. I'm offering you uh, Grand Canyon. And you go, Well, thank you very much, but look what my country has got to offer. And I'm offering you uh, where the addition. So, we're entering into modalities of exchange, but also a modality in which someone said, you know, you don't impress me with your Grand Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like, look what I've got. I've got something really groovy, uh, which is, uh, et cetera. And so I, sort of like by witnessing many of these, I started to find it sort of like that it comes from a sense of lack and inferiority on the part of the Lebanese. That is the need to want to kind of like, oh, I've got, I've got important things, sort of like don't think, sort of like 
especially in places where people don't know Lebanon a lot and where the Lebanese are subjected to things like uh, uh, sort of like Sahara, kind of like imaginaries of Lebanon, which the Lebanese think, oh my God, how dare you think uh, that Lebanon is a desert or what have you. And so you hit back by saying, oh, I've got a mountain, I've got, I've got this, I've got that. And so I started thinking about it as a part of the diasporic condition to be in this ongoing unequal exchange. And this inferiority is not racial inferiority, you see, because when I was doing, and I did a lot of work with the Lebanese in Venezuela, and uh, the Lebanese themselves in Venezuela are not exactly uh, politically uh, progressive, let's put it this way. <laughs> uh, and they are very racist. They are very racist towards the natives. Uh, so uh, I did not, I knew I was in the situation where I think you feel that you feel you are inferior, yet it's not the usual racial spectrum of inferiority, superiority, because on that spectrum, you actually think you are superior. So where is the source of this uh, inferiority? And that's where slowly it came down to me that it had to do actually with a very foundational thing, that, and which is actually a Venezuelan gave it to me on a plate almost. He said, when he said to me, we are the children of the country that cannot keep its children. And it was this idea of what does it mean to belong to a nation, to come from a nation which cannot keep its children. And, and this allowed me to start thinking about sort of like this comparison in a very, the comparative mode in a very different way, how to valorize, not valorize, what is going on. But also the, what happens is that the Lebanese split Lebanon into a good Lebanon and a bad Lebanon. And the good Lebanon is feminine and the bad Lebanon is masculine. And the good Lebanon is the countryside, the nature, sometimes the people, uh, etc. That's my mother, Lebanon. She would have never let me go if it wasn't for my nasty father. My nasty father, the government, or the ruling class, or etc., didn't know how to look after my mother. That's why she had to let go of me. So this is the concept that you find a lot in the diaspora. My mother's good nature, etc. My mother is bountiful. Uh, my mother loves to cuddle me when I set up at government, the ruling class. Sometimes it's nature versus the people, the people. You know, I, I, I'm pretty sure that it's not a joke that's specific to Lebanon. It's one of those jokes that circulate all the time. But Lebanese say it a lot, which is that, that when God created Lebanon, the countries around it got very jealous <laughs> and said, how come you made Lebanon so beautiful and the rest of us so ordinary? So God said, okay, you're right. And he created the Lebanese. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so this, this kind of like joke is within exactly the same kind of like structure of there's something good, something bad, something uh, etc. Now this unequal exchange allowed me to deploy a very important uh, category from uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, which is the co concept of anisogamy. And in Claude Lévi-Strauss's work, anisogamy is marriage between unequals, uh, unequal status, 
but also it's not marriage, it's exchange, obviously, sort of like which is uh, of interest to uh, Levis. Any imaginary of exchange that is between uh, unequal. And uh, in a way, but uh, that's basically all I've taken from uh, Levis sources, the idea of it, which is a lot. I mean, I'm very grateful. <laughs> Thank you very much, Claude. But uh, at the same time, I was more interested in Bourdieu-ing, if you like, as uh, a category, because I was more interested in strategic sort of like practices around anisogamy. I was interested in anisogamic strategies rather than just anisogamy. I was more interested in how people manage being in an anisogamic situation. How do they actually sort of like, uh, who valorizes, so it's very interesting because it led me actually to uh, do a whole ethnography of actual anisogamic marriage uh, through, through and looking at how the strategies of valorization and strategies of devalorization that happen in anisogamy. I mean, if, if a, a woman of an upper class uh, family ma marries a man, from a lower class family. It's very interesting because it's not in the interest of the woman if she's from upper class family to say, he comes from this really awful background, you know, thanks to me. It's just like not exactly the best formula for, <laughs> for a successful marriage. I mean, what's interesting is any organic marriage is work, right? So the labor that people put in, of co-valorizing allows the possibility of the marriage uh, to happen. And so I'm interested in the, those strategies. And often what you see, especially in Lebanese going to Western countries, is the expectation of being valorized and is organic. That is, they know that they are going to a country which is sort of like better because it keeps its children. But they hope to say, they hope that like the good anisogamic husband or wife, they say, your country is amazing, okay? But we know it's a game, but that's what people say in an anisogamic marriage. They don't say your family is crap because they say, oh, so, you know, this, it's very interesting, like, um, like if you say you're referring to uh, your wife's father who is uneducated, you don't say he hasn't been to school. You actually say he's incredibly intelligent. You don't, you don't mention the school. You say something that so you, there's modes of interaction where you actually valorize the person, even though you know. But it's very interesting because, so there's an expectation which doesn't come. And so when the expectation of valorization doesn't come, you start pumping narcissistically your own valorization. <laughs> I'm saying, ah, so my country, my, I come from, etc. And that's actually what happens in anisogamic uh, marriages that go downhill when, Sort of like in the and as in the case I study here, which which happens through uh, migration, you know, uh, you feel that sort of like the party with who are from an upper class starts throwing the lower class status on the person, saying, "Who the hell you think you are?" sort of like we have pulled you out of your situation. And that creates a totally negative dialectic. And you often find this negative dialectic in uh, the process of, uh, yeah. So this is all now bringing us to the lenticular condition. Comparative logic, comparative logic and is organically structured. As I was doing my field work, often I would come 
face to face with this structuring idea that stayed in my mind from my previous readings, which is that when there is a comparative logic, what you have really is, especially when you're comparing spaces, so when you say, I'm at the Grand Canyon, and I'm thinking of where the idea shame that one, I say, you are in Grand Canyon, and you're remembering what it is. You inhabit one space, and you remember the other space. And I kind of like accept this, which obviously everyone accepts it and makes sense. So it's like we are in one place and we uh, remember another place. However, increasingly, I came also to situations where I found that people were not referring to other spaces in terms of memory. Sometimes people themselves, so there was a woman young woman in Montreal, she was referring to her grandmother and she said, she's been in Montreal for 20 years and she lives as if she is in Lebanon. And I was interested in the as if she is in Lebanon because when I started talking to the woman herself, she had never used the as if Sort of like, and then I started coming across a number of situations ethnographically where people were saying, well, it's true I'm here, but I'm also in Vermont. I'm organizing this holiday for my daughter. And people were referring to being in here and being in there. And so this is what led me to think, well, well, maybe what they are comparing is not just being in one place and remembering another place. They're comparing different modes of inhabiting spaces. That, I mean, again, I don't think in either or logic here. I'm not trying to say this is what it is as a person to remember. I'm sure there's a lot of remembering, but I think the notion of being in one space and remembering another homogenizes our mind to the extent that we can't think the possibility of another source of the comparison. And that other source is the idea of inhabiting multiplicity. And here you have to think not in terms of inhabiting, obviously inhabiting, I'm now in the US, I'm not in Australia, I'm not inhabiting Australia, but, if you only have one conception of inhabitants, it won't work. But you have to pluralize also your conception of inhabitants. What does it mean to actually inhabit a space? And once you start thinking this, to me, it was a great adventure in thinking, really. Uh, it was a great adventure because it's sort of like, it kind of like you have to really de-articulate a lot of common sense stuff about your sense of being. I'm just sort of like, you know, people have no problem uh, thinking that they are in two places when the two places are concentric. So, you know, if I say to you, we are in Chicago and we are in the United States, no problem. <laughs> we are in Chicago and we are in the United States. But at the same time, we have to think, well, what does it mean we are in Chicago? It's actually an old anthropological ethnographic problem in the sense of like we say, I've gone and done field work in this village in Papua New Guinea. Yeah, but where did you actually do the field work? Did you do the field work in the village? Who did you talk to? Who, who, how do you end up thinking the village? Uh, so it's a question of how we inhabit space and claim certain space. And so I have no problem saying I am in Chicago, even though I'm still jet lagged, I only arrived last night. But 
you know, I haven't seen much of Chicago. <laughs> I came, arrived at night at 9 p.m., took a sleeping tablet in order to sleep a little bit because it's exactly sort of like the opposite in Australia at the moment. And so, and yeah, and woke up and so there's all this rain, you can hardly even. <laughs> so like, well, that made me feel I'm in Australia, given that it's flooding, <laughs> flooding at the moment. And anyway, so, so what is it that you say, I am in a place? Obviously, it involves a lot of past experience that you are remembering, like, but you are also articulating objects. You know you are at the University of Chicago because sort of like well there was a sign even that's comforting. <laughs> there's a sign says University of Chicago. Uh, sort of like there's these walls you recognize them from the past experience, so it's condensed, etc. That is you relate to your immediate material reality, but you also remember past experiences that are condensed. I mean, think of what it involves for you to think I am in Chicago, or even I am at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. How much you take for granted uh, and how much you rely not on immediacy, but on condensed knowledge, but also on safe sense of maps, uh, etc. You put your phone on, you see the map, you know you are, you, you know you but also sort of like accents and what have you. So you relate to things, you relate to memory. Even immediate knowledge involves memory, right? So even immediate inhabitants involve a lot of memory. So it's not an opposition between immediate access and memory. Immediate access involves memory as well. And so this kind of thinking sort of like started sort of like growing on me more and more into, uh, well, thinking, you know, is the object that we relate to metaphoric or metonym? You know, I'm going to give you an example from, from the book. There's a village above where I do field work called Kvistrop, where most of the people go to a place called Parramatta in Australia, in Sydney. That's about like an hour drive from Sydney. You get to Sydney Airport. you drive on something called Parramatta Road and you get to Parramatta where the villagers are living. So one day, one of the villagers stole the Parramatta Road sign from Australia and took it to the village and planted it in the middle of the village. So in the village in Lebanon, you wake up and you see this sign which says Parameter Road. And now, what's interesting is this is this sign a metaphor or a metonym? If it's a metaphor, it's, it means it's a reminder of Australia. If it's metonymic, it means it's a part of Australia that is the in the place here. So the sign is in a sense almost like a portal. <laughs> and it takes you to a place. And so, so I started thinking more of my ethnographic details in terms of whether they are metonymic or metaphoric. And I started becoming much more interested in how people relate to variety of objects. And and that's where I started noticing increasingly that people shift 
in the same place. They can be inhabiting the place and the other place at the same time. That is, this person is sitting, what, well, I'll give you an example from the book. This guy is totally crazy about uh, Elvis. <laughs> How boring. <laughs> totally. And he, he goes to Graceland and he's got sort of like a whole sort of like lounge, lounge room full of Elvis. Yeah, bulldogs, yeah, <laughs> whatever. On Next to it in the large room, there is a uh, bar built with Lebanese stone with a Lebanese season. There's a photo of his parents in the village. And he was actually showing them to me and holding his his son, and he was saying, see, I look on the left, I'm in America. I look on the right, I'm in Lebanon. And when he did that, his son went, ah, like this, like baby talk. And he said, yes, America, Lebanon, America, Lebanon. <laughs> and this is partly what gave me this sense of what I call lenticulum, and I've been talking too much, I think. But uh, how much more do you think I should talk? Uh, well, you want to save time for questions. Yeah. So uh, maybe five more minutes? Five. Yes, yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I talk too much about that. <laughs> so, what is a lenticulum? The reality. Uh, lenticular is a photography technique, which you all must have come across at one point in your life, which is the te technology that creates flip photography, you know, like smiling clown, frowning clown, this kind of stuff. Now, what's interesting about this technology is that it's perspective, that is, according to your perspective, as a perspective you interact, you see something. Like I had this photo when I was a kid, you know, above my bed, which had God, spirit, and you look at it this way, you see the Virgin Mary, and you look at it this way, you see Jesus. <laughs> they were all there on top of my bed for all of my youth, right? So, sort of like, but what's, now what is interesting about lenticular technology is that it's perspectival, but it's not perspectival in the sense of it depends on your point of view. What is, it's not the same photo that looks differently regarding, it's not the same photo. The photo itself embodies a multiplicity of realities. And when you interact with the photo from this side, it brings out a reality which is existing in the photo. That is, this is what we call ontological perspectivism. Ontological perspectivism means that the perspective brings forth reality the perspective brings forth. You're interacting with reality and reality comes out in the process of interacting with it. And so the lenticular photo contains two or three, depending, and it contains the potential of three realities as you relate to it. So not three takes on reality, three realities. It's very crucial, uh, sort of like that idea, because we are not talking about simply how you think about your kind of like bringing it forth. And so, 
And what I became interested in is precisely that, that I'm, I'm, people are sitting, sort of like they're sniffing Lebanese coffee. They hear uh, their daughter's uh, American accent. Uh, they are sort of like, uh, you know, they know from outside that the trays uh, are American trays, uh, but uh, they've got Lebanese music. And these become points of attachment points of attachment that locate them and inhabit them in one place or another. And it starts flickering. That's what's so interesting about diasporic reality. It's not a stable reality, it's a flickering reality. I mean, it makes me in, become interested in technologies of stabilization because when I start asking myself, why is this reality flickering? My main point is that it is the least institutionalized aspect. It is the least institutionalized. Therefore, whenever the state comes, whenever institutions come, they work as stabilization of this kind of like flickering. And they give us the sense of a far more sedate. Uh, so the lenticular is, uh, this flickering multiplicity. And I wanted to take you from here to show you that one can creatively uh, use this uh, concept, uh, not just uh, in relation to diaspora, but uh, many other places, but I don't have time anymore, sorry. Oh, well, I mean, you can also, in response to questions, please bring this up. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we have until 6 30 so uh please uh, when you raise your questions raise your voice too uh, that would be helpful and we'll also have questions from our zoom audience as well so um, yeah why don't you call on your own yes i should draw your attention that i i've got cochleas so i'm uh, hearing impaired and yeah so it were it would be good if you don't mind uh, to take your mask off so i can see you when you're actually i might come a bit close to you as well but uh, not too close <laughs> and uh, i usually joke that i don't want to intimidate people <laughs> but uh, in these circumstances there's also all kinds of other things yes Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, so I'm heavily relying on your work and your research, and I was wondering about the ability of the concept. If you can reflect more on this in your, in your introduction, you did work on the specificity, the universality of the of the condition of the Lebanese Christians. And I was wondering to what extent it can be applied to other Arab Christians. I'm also thinking about the fact that the Lebanese Christians in the diaspora are also engaging in spaces with other Arab Christians and how that imagination is. Surmising collectively, sort of. I have a second question, um, which has to do with the, with the, well, the actual the practices of actually creating spaces in the diaspora rather than just associating memory with the space uh, that, the, that the diaspora are confronting. Um, thinking, for example, about churches, the Orthodox Orthodox churches, and how, in a way, they are mediating uh, the split of the diaspora subject and creating a hybridity in the diaspora space. How would you think the concept of integrality uh, would figure that out? So, uh, the first thing about about uh, universality, partic particularity, you know, I think I think I I point out in the book that uh, we are sort of like much more inclined to attack universality in the name of particularity all the time. And say, oh, it's not. But, uh, and because we're right, the universal is never as universal as it claims. But I'd like to also say that the particular is never as particular as it claims as well. And, and, and so the oscillation between the particular and the universal, well, that's what it is. It is an oscillation rather than something is universal or something is. And I'm very happy with the sociology that tries to capture uh, specificities. But 
you know, it is probably a bit arrogant of me to say so, <laughs> but it is quite interesting that there is so little literature on diaspora as a transnational culture, as a life world. You know, there's a lot of work about as these migrants culture, they go there and it's transformed uh, into another culture. There's a lot of sociological work about transnational networks, which is a sociological concept, uh, even though it was created by an anthropologist. And uh, so what I mean by sociological, by the way, is not a discipline, but a uh, mode of thinking about uh, issues. Uh, and so, so for me, goes without saying that when I say uh, diasporic culture, and well, it's almost boringly true that I say, what about women? What about uh, working class? What about this? What about that? Well, yeah, of course, I mean, each, each person will, will have a very specific uh, take. But even Christian, you know, when I say Christian, you know, I mean, the people I concentrate on, which is to create the concept of diasporic modernity, are much more early wave, because you have to think sociologically in terms of waves of migration, which is, you have waves of migration later, which are, who are Christian and Muslim, and they share more in common because they are the same wave of migration rather than that early entrepreneurial uh, migration. So, and then, you know, like Christian in Lebanon, really Christian, what, Catholic, uh, Orthodox, what, uh, so like people can go on forever particular, particularizing North, South. And I don't think <coughs> the particularization is bad. I think it's a good job to do the particularization if you are interested in it. But sometimes you do it at the expense of saying, well, Okay, so do they share something or do they not share something in common, all of these particular things? It's just like when people say, we have today fluid identities <laughs> and uh, sort of like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm totally for fluid identities, but, you know, a fluid identity is an identity. Well, you have to start by saying it's an identity and it's fluid, otherwise it's not fluid identity, it's a series of different identities. If you are saying it is a fluid identity, you also have to do the job of capturing what it is that is changing and is being fluid. So my, my feeling is that you have to do always both the work of universalizing and particularizing and, and never just fall into one or, or another. I think in the book, I try to make clear that I am very sensitive to particularization, but at the same time that it has been under-researched, you know, the idea of a general culture. So I'm, that's why I'm kind of like pushing more towards uh, highlighting it. And in relation to lenticularity and churches, I, I just quickly, I give you a very interesting, some things, people relate to metaphorically, and some saints, they relate to metonymically. So when you look at Lebanese immigrants, Christian, uh, Catholic, uh, who take uh, the Virgin Mary with them when they're traveling, they take a photo and they're happy with the photo of the Virgin Mary. Because what's important for them is that, and this is how they talk about it, is that when they're traveling, they want the gaze of the Virgin Mary to be on them. And the photo kind of like materializes the gaze metaphorically. What is interesting about Saint Cherubim, who is the quintessential Lebanese saint, is that people are not happy with a metaphor. In fact, most people who have a statue of Saint Cherubim, they bring some earth from Lebanon and mix it with the cement in order for it to play a metonymic role. So again, what I'm saying is that you don't say just religious, 
so, so from my perspective now, I, or the key question is, uh, is it metaphoric or metonym? And even that, how much is it metaphoric and how much is it metonymic? Because it's not just a clear cut either, either or situation. Mm -hmm. There are also two questions from Zoom. That yes, can, uh, yeah, we have two questions now. Three. Um, maybe maybe we take two now and then go back to the audience. Sure. Um, and I hope if there's time, I may smother in a question. Please do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, for now uh, we have a question from here from R. Gabriel. Uh, she's asking. He's asking. Uh, he is. Uh, how is this diasporic condition manifested or expressed in contemporary artistic practices in Lebanon? Uh, what responsibility do the women have to their traditions in this condition? So this is uh, one question. We'll, we'll take maybe that one first, <laughs> and then it'll be easier for yes. us. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> 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 yes. Uh, well, I mean that's really, I mean a big, a big question. But I think I think um, one of the key issues that I found when I was uh, working with with people in Lebanon, which was more than two years ago, before COVID. Uh, you know, the importance of highlighting that sense of injury about uh, being people whose mother can't keep them, you know, that metaphor of, uh, sort of like off, that is often used. It has played, I think it can, uh, art has and can play a very important role in uh, the uh, beautifying the migrant experience. Uh, because, yeah, a lot of state tales about migration involve, as I'm sure most people who have gone to Lebanon and know about Lebanon know, sort of like it's about saying, it's almost an externalization of the glory of Lebanon, <laughs> sort of like, and the Phoenicians recast onto the world and all, all this kind of stuff. And so I feel that uh, one can undermine these, these tales uh, by, by incorporating these ideas in. So you had a, one more question from Zoom before we go back to the audience. So the second question is coming from Vivian Franklin Montfort. Uh, what would you say the limits are of an articular approach, uh, particularly in comparison to the approaches of melancholia and dwelling in between to articulate the diaspora condition? I say. I mean, I have no problem with dwelling in between or, or melancholia. They, they are obviously ethnographically very present in, in, my, uh, in my field work. And I even, even that's a bit pretentious to say because I don't need field work to know. <laughs> there is melancholia and there is, <laughs> there's, there's dwelling in between, you know. And so I'm not really at all. I, do, I mean, that's why I think it's important not to cast what I'm saying in terms of opposition to. I mean, the point is, I part of the tradition that has taught me always to think in terms of melancholia and always in terms of in-betweenness and hybridity uh, and all of this. And so it's simply, I've come to a point where I feel they are hegemonizing space and not allowing us to see other things. So it doesn't mean that not allowing us to see other things means what they used to let us see is not there. Yes, sure, it's there, and it's important. Thank you so much for this talk, and it was so fascinating to kind of hear the, the resources of the ethnographic imagination become sort of analytics for modernity and kind of, you know, for reaching community. I'm quite curious about the Montreal example specific, this woman acting as if she's in Lebanon, because I was in Montreal last week helping my cousin look for an apartment, right? And right away, there's a moment where the guy who's showing us the apartment hears her name. It's like, Greek? No, Italian. Oh, I do lots of business with the Italians. It's okay. So there's a 
There's a recognition and interpolation of lenticularity in quite as clear and strategic and unproblematic way that I would not expect in another city, right? And this was a condo in a you know, very white bread part of Montreal. This was not an enclave for an ethnic community, but there's a degree to which in particular cities like Montreal, the recognition of that being in multiple places is woven into kind of the vernacular of life, of everyday life, right? In a way that maybe, you know, saying, oh, well, you know, uh, St. Patrick's Day is for the Irish and Columbus Day is for the Italians, right? That's more like keeping it on the ritual calendar. That's more like yeah. keeping it separate from the everyday. So to this question of kind of, you know, where did things go from here? I'm curious, like, why do you think that recognition flourishes in, in particular cities where various diasporas happen to, you know, see one another, but maybe not so much in others, right? Like, what are the, what are the kind of local conditions of lenticular recognition within urban, particular kinds of urban histories? And, and maybe that's a big question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about starting to think uh, lenticular ontologies is that uh, It has allowed me to do a number of things. One, which is what I call ethnographies of intensification. And so, because the lenticular is dependent on attachment to points, that these points being metonymic. So, some realities in the flickering become more intense than others. And the ethnographies of various intensities at the same time as the ethnography of the oscillation itself. I'm interested in rates of oscillation and uh, rhythms of oscillation, and uh, uh, even in ontological uh, uh, disturbances to uh, the oscillation. So, in that sense, what each sort of like what you seem to be describing sort of like I, I have I haven't done an ethnography of Montreal. That's one of the things sort of like you choose to do an ethnography of the network of migrants means you have to give up an ethnography of the place. And so yeah, so I don't know what 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 you are saying, uh, but it rings to me interesting in the sense of like it involves the conditions of thinking why an awareness of lenticularity can, can be different from one place. And the desire sometimes to uh, stabilize it by governments or, uh, yeah, I mean, I can, I can even think of a definition of racism as an attempt to negate lenticularity uh, because racism itself is in some ways so, dependent on a monorealist claim, uh, sort of like on the idea, no, there's nothing wobbly, there's there, sort of like, I don't like wobbly things. <laughs> That's what the racist says, basically. And so wobbly realities become uh, the enemy, if you like. Um, and so, yeah. I think we should get Hadil's question in here because she's laboring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for this talk. Um, my question is uh, about the comparative spatiality, the comparative spatiality, uh, the primacy not only of space over time, but of simultaneous value for this possible over time uh, within that like, condition of lenticularity. So there's this recurrent this statement, especially after August 4 explosion, that sort of goes in the lines of uh, I had left Lebanon long before leaving it, of that kind of investment that yes. precedes or that you know by square groups whether taken or not they're already paved in the consciousness that modern Lebanon really is. But then in your book there was an ethnographic moment that was fascinating in which um, uh, the, the proposition was I am here in the US or Sydney but a part of me never left yes. Lebanon. Yes. 
perspective. So on the one hand, leaving Lebanon before actually leaving, or I have left it, and then it's a part never left Lebanon. And in that way, it seems that there's always a twofold absence already inscribed in these um, in, in this condition, but also an absence that points to different Lebanons, right? To a multiplicity not only of so the comparative speciality seems to also uh, bleed into the Lebanon, the multiplicity of Lebanons that that are that seem to also uh, be in a way, um, yeah, yes, um, perhaps even antagonistically yes. uh, relating to one another. And my question is: um, Is this lenticular dialogue? Because I think you capture it as a dialogue. Is it ever a dissonance? And does it is it at all? a dissonance, a lenticular dissonance? Yes. Um, as a space of abandonment yes. being then a space of refuge. Yes. Uh, and if that's the case, then what would it mean? What, what is there an ontological significance that there are uneven entities epistemologically, right? Because a space and then a derived space. Space of Lebanon, in Lebanon, and then outside of the derived space. Yes. So, yeah. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, I, th I think it's very important to to highlight here before, before because that when we talk about uh, uh, ontological realism, it always assumes the experiential subject. The reality is the reality of specific subjects. And so it's not about someone from the outside watching and saying, this is, uh, so this, sort of like those experiences. Now, I think it's, uh, it's quite interesting how fluid that situation is when you, so, um, you know, like when I, in the book, sort of like differentiate between the need, the need to migrate, the desire to migrate, and the capacity to migrate and the interaction between these three. How uh, sometimes the desire to migrate increases the more you feel that you can't leave. And as you can't leave, the more you can't leave, the more you start seeing the place claustrophobically. You even start hating your your parents, and you see you see them. You think everything here is stopping me from leaving. That's the opposite of that. Everything is stopping me from leaving. Then, is the moment you get the visa, you can leave. But the moment you get the visa, the claustrophobic quality of the place disappears, and therefore the place you are leaving, the more, the reason why you want to leave it, the moment you can leave it, it changes. So what I'm saying to you is that the subject situated in Lebanon saying, saying, I, uh, what was it? I, I have left Lebanon, etc. It's not the same subject that has, that has left in a way to compare, compare them because they have left and they have the ability uh, to live. But it's interesting also, I think it made me think what you, have, what you have mentioned is quite important because with the explosion, uh, we've had an explosion of discourse on my way. <laughs> the explosion has brought an explosion of discourse and that's quite important to keep in mind sociologically because the explosion has hit the arty, middle-class, high cultural capital parts. The people who have access to the means of talking about their misery. And so for, for me as an ethnographer, it's a very important issue, sort of like who is capable to talk because there's so many people who are experiencing things we, that we, we don't have access to them because not everyone has the means of talking about the experience. So fortunately or unfortunately for the rest of the world, the explosion hit the people who can talk best about 
their misery and their experience, etc. And so this raises that issue of, of the universal uh, specific sort of like in relation to how how they voice them. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank you for this talk. It was truly like the most engaging academic talk I've been to. And I think that's for two reasons. Uh, I relate to it on two levels. First, uh, I'm a child of two immigrants from Iran. And so a lot of the examples you related were, you know, just ex exactly it. But then, second of all, I think I relate to it as an undergraduate at the University of Chicago because you mentioned, you know, that you're here in Chicago, but it really isn't. You're only seeing the university, you took a sleeping pill, et cetera. But the, the, the experience of the undergraduate at the University of Chicago is, is kind of similar to that. There's a, there's, a specific set of, <laughs> there's a specific set of neighborhoods one visits. If you walk, uh, no one walks three miles south of campus. Yes. And I, I, I'm thinking about the example you gave uh, earlier in your talk about you know, the European peasant uh, going into the city and developing this kind of national consciousness there. And you know, even in that, there, there are certain parts of the city that the, that the English proletarian sees in London. There are certain parts that uh, the bourgeois sees of London, and of, but there's still a national consciousness that eventually over years develops. I wonder what you think will happen um, with this new paradigm of, um, you know, everywhere being the site of migration. What kind of consciousnesses can develop, and do you think will be um, left within these particular areas? Thanks. Yes. I. By the way, I think. Uh, thank you, first of all, because the. I think the university experience is uh, very much uh, diasporic experience by by, by excellence in in uh, so many ways. So, you know. I think uh, so. Like one of the things I uh, try very hard to do in this book is uh, sort of like, if you like, uh, there's a there's a long tradition of using migration specifically in anthropology to create a certain long time ago anthropologists were interested in tribes now they are interested in everything i <laughs> <laughs> kind of like and so they people use migration as a kind of before after uh, and what I try to do is actually uh, work very hard on showing that you can claim the anthropological tradition and uh, work on migration. And one of the key issues, and that, that brings me to your, your question, in thinking the lenticular condition, uh, and I'm giving a paper specifically on that uh, in, in, in Germany, which is what, I, what is called strategic exoticization. And the idea is that, well, the idea is that instead of going to the island, look at weird people, you can weave yourself, <laughs> if you like, <laughs> make that you find something exotic in strategically about your yourself to now part of this and that that in the whole anthropological tradition there's always this idea if you take just one uh, simple example um, marcel moss uh, the nephew of uh, durkheim went to study societies where the gift was prominent he didn't. He did not go and say, "These are societies that where there's lots of gift exchange, and our society doesn't have gift exchange." No, he said, "These are societies where the gift is prominent, and so I can analyze it. And once I've analyzed it, I'm going to come back and look at my society, and actually, it gives me a certain sensitivity." To be able to find how gift exchange exists here. 
where I'm living. And so in a way, I'm doing exactly the same with the lenticular condition. I'm saying the Lebanese diaspora is a space which has allowed me to analyze the lenticular condition because it's much more pronounced because it's not captured by institutions, etc. But once you see the lenticular condition, you come and you start seeing lenticular conditions everywhere, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> and so, so that's why the ontological question is important because instead of thinking, uh, this is one reality here, this is another, you start thinking in terms of dominant and dominated realities, minor and major realities. So, so lenticular reality is more pronounced here, it's less pronounced here, but now I, my, my senses and my mind has trained itself to capture how it is happening uh, analytically, so I see, see it more even when it is not uh, pronounced. I think we have time for one more question. Um, yeah, my question is sort of in relation to Adil's comment about like how there's a multiplicity of Lebanon. Is that multiplicity captured by your interlocutors in Montreal, or as a as does the Lebanon that that individual lives in somehow exhibit more of a rigidity or kind of two dimensional quality? Could you speak to like? whether there's when experience from Montreal, like Lebanon takes on certain qualities that differ. Okay, thanks. Well, that's what we mean by experiential realities. Like there are, there are specific, specific realities, but at the same time there are, yeah, I mean, it's like all some, all things that are specific. You can make things so specific that are specific to individuals, but in a social science tradition, you also want something that's specific to categories. So you think of it as more a group or social fact uh, type, uh, type situation. What is quite important is that not to see these realities as lacking compared to the real reality or something like this, you know, I think that's a trap. Uh, uh, even uh, in, interestingly, I, I, I kind of like myself had convinced myself for a little while that, well, you know, there's nothing like the real, real kind of like, sure, but when I'm in Lebanon, I'm in Lebanon, sure, I cuddle people and etc. I'm in Lebanon, let's not sort of like play games here, sort of like, etc. But what's interesting is that um, there are even certain affective conditions that flourish at a distance uh, better than close up, you know, there's certain loves that happen better at a distance than, than close up. So these, that, these conditions are not always have to be seen as lacking something because they can also offer new possibilities and new uh, foundation, which, uh, Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Professor Hassan Hara.